I like to do a lot of open source work, especially in free time, as much as I can and at work. Uh, relevant to this talk, um, I'm a committer at, uh, on the Tulip project, which is the original name for Async.io. I'm also on the core team for LiveUV, which is the event loop powering uh, Node.js. And I've written uh, event loop replacements for Twisted, Tornado, and Gvent to play with them and see how things worked out. So let's see what we can learn from that. So um, let's say we start doing our uh, Sockets 101 example. So an echo server that handles a single client. Uh, we just create a, a server socket. We bind to an address. We're listening there. And when we get a single connection, we read some data there. Uh, when there's no data, it means that the client disconnected. Uh, and then we just send the data again. So that's an echo server. Now, uh, the problem with this approach is basically that we can only handle one client, which is kind of not very web scale. Um, so I always hard, but um, so last year I gave a talk on how an actual event loop works. So I'm going to sort of skip all that and you'll take a leap of faith with me and believe that SyncIO is bad, but as async is good. Uh, we'll assume that from now on. Uh, based on the fact, um, we we'll also know that there are different paradigms in Unix and Windows for doing I.O. Basically on Unix is uh, readiness based uh, APIs in, in that you say, are you ready? Are you ready to send some data on socket? Whereas on Windows, they're actually better. They are like, oh, please send this and call me back when you're done. Um, so there are differences which we need to, we need to know they're different. Um, so event loops are the way to go. We will assume that as well. And if you don't believe so, have a look at the C10K problem. Um, and there's a nice explanation there. So uh, because IO is hard, let's go shop and find a framework that solves it for us. Now, frameworks, uh, what we want from a framework is one platform abstraction. So we want it to work with good performance on all platforms, Windows, Linux, um, different Unixes, whatever. And we don't, need, we don't want to take care of it. We also want uh, some protocol implementation. So we want to do HTTP for the most part and some other things. Uh, interaction with other event loops is also desirable, like with a Qt event loop, if you're doing some graphics as well as you're networking. Uh, and frameworks will also provide us different API styles. So let's look at some of them. Uh, so Twisted, it uses the different polars on Unix available on the select module. And on Windows, it uses IOCP, which is the fast way of doing IO. The, the completion ports. It does provide interaction with other event loops like Qt, and it has these nice abstractions for building protocols, transports, factories. It uh, can get confusing, but is, is very useful in practice. And it has the deferred object, which is kind of the thing you need to understand to grasp uh, Twisted. Uh, Tornado is uh, similar in that it uses the polars from the select module, but it uses select on Windows, which means it can only do 64 file descriptors per thread, so not very web scale. Uh, it's mainly oriented to web development, so that's slightly different from, from Twisted in the sense that uh, there are no like protocols per se. Tornado is sort of to the web kind of thing. And it has a synchronous looking API using uh, core routines. So we go from an API which is callback based using deferreds to a synchronous looking API uh, using coroutines. Uh, Gevent uses libv or libvent, um, libv in the latest version, uh, but libv uses select on Windows, so we're back to the same problem. Uh, and it uses and it does a synchronous API using using Greenlet. So for those who were on my previous talk today, you may have seen a slide I had on how to sort of make a callback. Uh, sorry, make an asynchronous function look synchronous using Greenlight. We'll see something similar later. Uh, there was the async core module in the standard library, but apparently, well, it wasn't good enough. So there was this big email thread on mailing list, uh, async core include batteries don't fit. And uh, that ended up spawning the discussion, which ended up with, these, uh, with this pep. Now, the solution to uh, not having, to basically, the solution to all these frameworks is of course, to build a new one, <laughs> <laughs> which will solve all the problems. But in the in Hido's words, he was he's not trying to build to reinvent the wheel, but trying to build a good one. Uh, so um, enter Tulip, which is the code name for the actual project that is the reference implementation for Pev 3158, which we'll explore now. The boring name chosen for the standard library is Syncio. So um, I, I use them interchangeably because I like so, but I'd rather use Tulip. 
So uh, yeah, it's the reference implementation, and it has the basic components. So it's not like a completely, it doesn't have all those protocols like twisted. It's the basic components. It works officially on Python 3.3, though I have some news at the end. Uh, the goals of this implementation are to provide this modern implementation. So this has been done in the past few months, in the past months, the past year. It's, it hasn't been developed for so many years, and there's, there's not, uh, let's say, a lot of baggage to carry. So uh, the idea is to use yield from and encourage to use it um, with coroutines, but not depend on it. So you, you can do callbacks if you want, or you can do yield from. Uh, it doesn't use anything that requires <coughs> features that are not there in Python 3.3, uh, so that people can use Tulip currently with Python 3.3, assuming you're using it, because you all are, right? Uh, Fortunately, not even me. Um, and interoperability with other frameworks is something that is desired. We'll see how that translates. Now, uh, the goals are to have also Windows and Unix support equally, so everything should work on both. TCP, UDP, pipes, subprocesses. So basically, all the low-level components we need to do I/O. Plus, there should be basic SSL. So should uh, whatever we do with it should be like secure with same defaults with regards to security. The known goal is to achieve perfection or find the answer to all mankind questions. It's also not, uh, not a goal to replace current frameworks, but to collaborate with them into like, building the ultimate event loop and the ultimate protocol implementations and so on. It's also not a goal to provide implementation. So a SyncAL doesn't include a built-in HTTP server implementation. There is a third-party library doing that. Uh, but it's not part of this. It's also not part of the project to replace the standard library modules doing some protocols with uh, other implementations that work on top of AsyncIO. And it's also not a goal to make it work with Python 3.2 or even 2.7 or whatever. So what does interoperability mean with regards to the event loop? So basically, since AsyncIO is an event loop which lays on top the selectors module, that's new in, in Python 3.4, but uh, it's just a pure Python module, easily backportable. And the IOCP, which is a C module to do the IO on Windows. And then other frameworks could just sit on top and at some point ditch their own event loop implementation because you can feel some wheel reinvention here, like everyone is doing the select thing again and running into the same problem. And oh my god, these file descriptors in KQ on OSX, they are fucked, so you need to do select on another thread. So in the end, everyone ends up trying to solve the same problem. So maybe if we solve them once, we don't need to worry about them anymore. Uh, Tornado already did it. I think that was a smart move because basically uh, Tornado can now run on top of AsyncIO, which means you get the benefits of whatever library that is built for AsyncIO. You get it for free in Tornado if you, you're running it on top of uh, AsyncIO. For example, uh, Jonathan showed us uh, AsyncIO Redis, and uh, you could, well, basically use it with Tornado if, uh, with whatever you're doing as well uh, and other protocols that somebody may come up with. Uh, I did a little experiment. Instead of uh, replacing another framework with AsyncIO, I replaced AsyncIO itself with something else. See what, what happened. Uh, so I replaced it with, I called it Rose, and I replaced the event loop of AsyncIO itself with the event loop uh, from Node.js with the bindings I wrote, which is PyUV. Uh, this was mostly an educational <coughs> thing, but it kind of proved the point that a SyncIO can be used as a replacement for others, but its own event loop is also replaceable, and all tests pass and everything works just fine. So uh, it means it's well designed and well built. So a bit about the architecture. Uh, I grouped components in like three areas, the event loop and the policy, curtains, futures and tasks, and transports and, and protocols. So event loop. The event loop is what will choose the best I.O. mechanism for uh, on the platform we are, and it will give us all the APIs for creating the different connections like UDP, MTCP, pipes, managed subprocesses, and so on and so forth. We have some functions to schedule callbacks, like whenever possible, call soon, call later, like after a given amount of time, call at, at a given uh, point in time, and time will give us the current time of the loop. There is, no there is explicitly no function for doing a repeatable callback because there's actually discrepancies in how you should do it and how you should account for time, but it's very easy to do it with uh, these APIs. 
Uh, there's also uh, an APIs for adding callbacks for uh, readiness. So when a file descriptor is ready and so on, like Unix style, get the callback. You're not encouraged to use this in the sense that you shouldn't use them because probably there's an abstraction built on top of these functions already for you, like the transports, we'll see. There's also handling of Unix signals on Unix systems. Uh, so this takes care of running the callbacks for a signal on the event loop thread, which will be on the main thread and so on. Well, assuming you're running it on that one. Uh, now, at some point, we may need to work with threads. And this is done using the concurrent futures uh, executors from pev 3 and 4 8 So there are, there's that function running executor, which by default, it will run on a, well, by default, the loop will create a, f uh, a five thread thread pool executor, if I recall correctly, and will run the function you want there. An example of what runs on this executor is get a DDR info. That's a blocking syscall, which needs we just drop it on a thread and then wait until you get the result. Uh, for starting and stopping the event loop is, is pretty simple. So run forever will run the loop until you stop it, basically. So until you call the stop function. This is usually how you want to run it. Like, OK, I want to spawn a server or whatever, and a traditional echo server. So until you just do run forever, and at some point, somebody will call stop, like when you, I don't know, on control C or on a signal. Uh, and there's another function that run until complete, which gets a future or a core routine, which means run the event loop until this, this uh, work here, this future is done. Now, this is, uh, you m the, the event loop cannot run re uh, recursively in the sense that you can't uh, call run forever twice or run until complete twice until one of them is done. So this is, mo this is used for the most part in uh, while testing, of course, and also on the startup time. So when you want to, for example, start listening for incoming connections, you may do get the DDR info on localhost to get all your IP addresses, and, and then you start listening on everything. Uh, to get the event loop instance or set it, uh, you can use these functions. So you can get the current event loop, uh, which is the event loop on the current context. Uh, you can set the event loop in the current context, so you can create a new event loop. Now, what is the context? The context is the pol is basically wrapped in an object called policy. So it defines what the context is. By default, this context is a thread. So there will be one single event loop per thread, and the event loop for the main thread is automatically created for you. Um, blah, 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 blah. And we can change the event loop policy, like rows changes, for example, the policy to create PyUV enabled event loops. Uh, so let's see what uh, coroutines, futures, and tasks have to do with the event loop. So coroutines in, in the context of AsyncAO are just, is a generator function that can receive values. Well, this is plain coroutines in Python. We'll simplify like that. It's decorated with a coroutine decorator. The decorator does nothing, but it gives us a hint without looking at the body of the function that a function can be waited for, right? Because it's a coroutine. Otherwise, we'll need to squint the code and see, oh, it has a yield from or whatever. Um, a future is, a pro is an object which represents a promise of a result or an error, which will happen in the future. And then we have a task, which is a future which runs a core routine. We'll um, look at those a bit later. So here's an example uh, with using core routines and, and yield from. So here we create a socket, we bind to it, we listen, we set it in, uh, to be non-blocking, and then we run until complete, as we said, uh, the accept connection function. So here, on an infinite loop, we assume that uh, we, we block here. We see this yield from. So by way of magic, let's say, we wait until we get an incoming connection on our, on our server. And then we use asyncao.async, which creates a new task to run the handle client function. The handle client function will just, uh, on an infinite loop as well, read from the socket and uh, send the data. Now, if you look at this, it, it, it could look like things block, and you cannot handle more than one connection concurrently. However, you can. So imagine the yield from is not there. So take a leap of faith. And imagine the code is executed sequentially. However, uh, two, co two of those coroutines can run at the same time in the, in the event loop, because we use the task, we'll see. So the coroutines here, when you see yield from, don't think of a strict PEV 380 definition, because the event loop is actually doing a scheduling, like, oh, you need to wait. OK, I'll call you back and resume this coroutine later. 
Uh, so the futures in SNKO are similar to the futures in PET3148, uh, but the, the, um, the API is almost identical. Here is, is just a few of the functions. It has some differences, like the removed on callback and um, some other things I forgot. Uh, but it's, it's pretty much the same. Now, uh, the thing is, futures are also working with GL from in the context of our event loop because they implement the iterator protocol as well. So we can do GL from future, and what will happen there is that we will suspend the coroutine and it will be resumed when somebody asynchronously sets the result on that future. So we basically can do yield from coroutine, yield from future, and they would work the same. Usually, you don't create future yourself, but functions return them. And here is an example on, of how uh, we could make an asynchronous function, a function that gets a callback, uh, look synchronous with the help of a future. We create a future, then we call our async function, which gets a callback, and in the callback, we set the result or we set an exception in our future. And then the return value of our function would be uh, yield from future. So at this point, it's a kind of weird to see a return yield from to any keywords here, <laughs> but this actually works. So the idea is that when we hit this yield from a statement, we, uh, we would jump off this coroutine, some other coroutine would run, and then when this callback is asynchronously called and sets the result, this coroutine would be resumed, we get our value or exception here, we return it or, well, raise it. Now, what are tasks? Well, tasks are magical entities covered in fairy dust. And it's a coroutine wrapped in future, whatever that means. <laughs> so they inherit from future. And what they do is they run a coroutine step by step. So when it, it uh, hits a yielding point, it just uh, it will uh, schedule callbacks to be called uh, on the event loop so that the event loop calls you back to so that you can resume the coroutine you have uh, stopped. And because it also works uh, inherits from future, works with yield from as well. I think it got a... Uh, so uh, then what's the difference between a task and a coroutine? Well, the difference is that a plain coroutine uh, would basically block the whole thing. So if we are just uh, yielding from something, then unless the event loop arranges for that coroutine to be resumed at some point, your program would, wouldn't do anything else. It cannot advance. However, tasks uh, have actually m communicate with the event loop. When a task hits a yielding point, OK, I bail out, run something else. It will run, the event will run other callbacks. And then some of those callbacks, triggered by I.O. usually, will re make this task be resumed. Like, OK, we're waiting for I.O. on this socket. And then when there is I.O., we get the callback, and we resume the attack. So looks a bit magical in a way it is, um, but you'll get used to it. So here's an example of using those. Uh, we call, let's say we create a, we call a start server here. This will return a future uh, we, to create a server listening on this port. We run until complete, and at that point uh, we're already running, so we run forever. We're ready. Now, when we get a connection on handle client, uh, whoops, sorry, on accept client, we create a new task to handle the connection for this client. This would be like, okay, I will handle each connection on a different task. Uh, we would use the add-on callback because the inherits from future, which is the same, to basically do some cleanup. And then the task will run the handle client core routine. And uh, we, here we would just read from the client over and over again and uh, then write data on it. Basically, it's an echo server, a concurrent echo server. Now, what about transports and protocols? Basically, a transport represents a connection and a protocol represents an application. So a protocol is RC, HTTP, a transport is TCP, UDP, and so on. They always go together. The API is based on function calls and callbacks. So interoperability between protocols is done at this layer. Actually, uh, Antoine Pitrou uh, did an implementation of a protocol for, for the asterisk uh, manager interface, which works both with twisted and async IO because it only uses callbacks, no coroutines here. So we have APIs to create a connection, an outgoing connection, or create a listening connection. We create an outgoing connection. Uh, we create a transport and protocol pair. When we listen, we will get a transport protocol pair with each incoming connection. Uh, then there are some convenient APIs to create something which is uh, called a stream, which wraps uh, a protocol and a transport. And then we can, we can use blocking looking APIs like yield from uh, object.readline and uh, basically I will wait until there's data and so on. 
uh, the transport will call some functions in the protocol, for example, when the connection is made, when data is received, and the file. Uh, there are different functions depending on the transport type, so uh, you should check that on the PEP itself. The protocol uh, also will call functions in the transport, like if you want to write some data and you want to put it on the wire, it would call write. We have a sequence, well, write lines. Uh, you can write in the file or you can close the transport if you want. There are some other extra functions, one of the relevant ones being get extra info. This is basically like uh, let's put some data on the transport and uh, there you can fetch, for example, the SSL context in case we're talking about an SSL transport and so on. Uh, you could also get the socket object itself, though I don't recommend it. Not all transports may have the socket there. Now, news. Uh, recently, uh, Victor Steiner created the Trollius project, which is basically a backport of SyncAO to 2.6. What Hido didn't want whatsoever, but it's possible. <laughs> However, you need to adjust a bit the syntax. So uh, there is no yield from, so yield needs to be used all the time. And also, you cannot do return from a generator, so the trick is usually to raise uh, an instance of a special class like return. Looks pretty horrible to do raise return x, but well, uh, that actually works on Python 2.6 as well. Uh, it's available on pip, so you can do pip install trollius, and that will just work. Uh, the status of all this is that the pip has been provisionally accepted. It has been available on Python 3.4 for a while, uh, since the beta one, I think. And uh, it's also on PyPy, so you can uh, pip install uh, AsyncAO, and that will work on Python 3.3 and onwards, or pip install Trollius if you are the Python 2 type. It's uh, still evolving, so changes are uh, expected, but not like dramatical changes. So uh, that's kind of all I got. Um, this wasn't all, so I encourage you to read the pep. It's a, it's a good and easy read. There's also more stuff uh, that they didn't talk about. There are synchronization primitives, which are event loop friendly, like a queue and a log, and so on. Uh, you may want to start by implementing a simple protocol, like an IRC client. This is a good exercise. Uh, check out the third-party libraries. Um, there, are, there are a few of them already. Uh, Jonathan's Redis client, um, iMedica Agustin's WebSocket library, uh, there is already a bunch of web frameworks because we need more web frameworks. <laughs> um, there is that thing I made, Rose, if you want to take a peek on how to replace those. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff already happening. It's not like, oh, we put the event loop, nobody cares, right? Uh, and uh, well, if you can, uh, then use it in your next project. So uh, if you got any questions, feel free to ask now. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> find my contact details on my website and feel free to come in. Cancellation, yes. Yes, yes. yes, you can cancel a task. So it will just abort what it's doing. Okay. Well, of course, um, not everything is cancelable. Yes. <laughs> so if you're not, not relinquishing control, you're, not doing, you're doing some CPU uh, bound tasks, for example, chances are, well, you can't cancel it. I, is the task, uh, the code of the, of the subroutine, responsible of handling the cancellation, or is it just cancelled automatically? Well, you can call, if you get, a, a, if you actually get acquire the, the task object, so if you save a reference to it, because if you say you have a core routine and you call asyncao.async and you pass the core routine, that will create the task and start running it for you. But like if you, if you don't care about it, it will just run, so you have no means of calling cancel on it. But if you save an instance, you can call cancel on it and then it will not run. Let's say you arrange for it, but you, you don't start it, so then you could you could cancel it yes To be honest, I don't remember the details, but I think it did host verification by default. If you create an, an SSL server, basically, all the. Um, but one thing I probably should have mentioned is that 
Async IO was built with 100% standard library modules. So the SSL support is built with the SSL module itself. So the same defaults of sorts is just the default values for the parameters you can pass to create server, which if I recall correctly, they do have host verification on by default, but uh, you can check it out quick in the, either in the PEP or, or in the source code for that matter, which is an easy read. Uh, what decorator? Uh, yes, that, wa that was intentional. So the idea is that now um, you do it in a more... So basically that decorator became the asyncao.async function call. So if you want to make a core routine running a task asynchronously, you use that function call because it's more obvious what you're doing. Or you can create a task object and that's it. But the idea is that you are more explicit. Otherwise, you may, you may squint quickly through the code and say, what does this do? And forget about that. Okay, thank you. Thanks.